Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. 25 years for a murder, it doesn't seem quite, quite what the sentence should have been. They are talking to each other, but is the divide between the DA, Joe Gonzalez, and Police Chief William McManus still growing? The Bear County District Attorney's Office told a victim's family that San Antonio police mishandled evidence in a murder case that ended in that 25 year plea deal. We first brought you the story about that man sentenced yesterday. Today, San Antonio Police Chief William McManus reacted to that accusation against his department. He told our Erica Hernandez investigators did their job. I don't see any issue evidentiary or otherwise with the way we handled this case. SAPD Chief Willie McMahon is getting straight Stop to the there. point today. That's after Kevin Perez took a 25 year plea deal Tuesday for shooting and killing Arnulfo Cortez as he was driving along Loop 410 in December 2020. Cortez's family told KSAT via text message the case couldn't go to trial because SAPD mishandled evidence, according to the DA's office, and more specifically that SAPD conducted an illegal search on the weapon Perez was carrying. Chief McManus strongly disagrees. I don't know what was said or what wasn't said, um, but I, I do know that from a, a uh, evidentiary standpoint, there was nothing wrong with uh, our handling of that weapon. We circled back with the district attorney's office asking for a specific answer to why the Cortez family was told that SAPD mishandled the case. They told us, quote, that it was difficult to comment on what the family was told. Later today, District Attorney Joe Gonzalez released this statement that reads in part, quote, our office has no criticism of either the investigation or evidence obtained by the San Antonio Police Department. The relationship between our office and the SAPD on this case was collaborative, cooperative, and successful. The work provided the basis for a substantial conviction and helped get a violent offender off the street. Kevin Perez, who was a convicted felon prior to this case, is now eligible for parole in 12 and a half years. When someone feels that justice wasn't served, because that, that's something that they'll, they'll never get closure on. And again, my, you know, my heart goes out to the, to the Cortez family. Uh, that, that's just not something that a family should have to live with for the rest of their lives. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. So what does the family say tonight? Well, the Cortez family, who does not live in San Antonio, sent us this statement, quote, failed at every level. I feel we were manipulated to think the plea deal was our best option. We are grieving, vulnerable. We don't know the system. We aren't supposed to be going through this. We trusted state appointed professionals to guide us. We hope someone is held accountable, end quote. A man with a violent criminal history and out on parole is accused of terrorizing a Stone Oak neighborhood. 34 year old Christopher Rodriguez was seen on ring doorbell video walking up to a home with a gun in his hand and law enforcement says that's not the only house he visited on Sunday. An incident report from the Bear County Sheriff's Office says Rodriguez banged on the back window of another house and told the neighbors he would start shooting if they did not let him inside. The homeowner who shared that video with us says that her kids were inside the home alone. When you see a guy like that at your house, outside your house with a gun, just the worst things go to your head. Rodriguez is now back in custody. He has a lengthy and violent criminal history dating back some 15 years. Just last week, the Bear County Sheriff's Office began investigating after a woman claimed Rodriguez punched her while he was driving a car. Tonight, San Antonio police searching for the person who they say hit a man with a pistol and then robbed him. It happened just before 1030 last night in the 1600 block of Jackson Keller Road. That's not far from Lee High School. According to police, the victim told officers he was shot in the leg and robbed just a few blocks away. That's when he drove to a nearby apartment looking for help. The victim taken to University Hospital. He's expected to recover. No description of the suspect has been released. 
Let's go to the border now and take a look here at some video that shows some of what is happening there along the US Mexico border. This video from ABC shows migrants riding on top of trains and some of that video also shows people in the river crossing over into Eagle Pass. And that's where our Jonathan Cotto is reporting tonight. He spoke with county officials who tell us how many migrants they're seeing cross the border currently and why that person thinks they're crossing now. The situation here in Eagle Pass is evolving rapidly. What we've been able to see is the number of migrants crossing into the U.S. increase day after day. Now, we do know these migrants are crossing or making their way into Texas downriver south of Eagle Pass. They are making their way by foot on this dirt path you see here. Many of them leaving behind personal items and their clothing. As you can see, a lot of clothes stuck on that concertina wire. Once they reach this point, they are being brought underneath International Bridge Number 2, where we are told they are being busted to different processing centers across Eagle Pass. We did have an opportunity to speak with Maverick County Sheriff Tom Schmerber. This is what he had to say. It's something that I never saw. I was, uh, thought that I was going to see, see in Eagle Pass. Uh, I know that up till now we have 3,000 uh, individuals crossing. Yesterday we had 2,700. Uh, and I'm thinking maybe tomorrow more. So it's something that I never thought that I would see this in Eagle Pass. Now the sheriff says this is a first for Eagle Pass. Unlike Del Rio, Brownsville, and even El Paso, Eagle Pass hasn't seen this amount of border crossings. And he says they do anticipate to see more tomorrow morning. Now he says this is largely due to the messaging that criminal organizations are putting out to the migrants, alerting them that the borders are open. Reporting from Eagle Pass, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. We've got an update from Jonathan's report here. Just under an hour ago, Customs and Border Protection gave an update on their operations in Eagle Pass. Officials say that as of now, vehicle processing at International Bridge 1 and the International Railway Crossing Bridge have been suspended. The reason is so that personnel can assist Border Patrol in taking migrants into custody. The city of San Antonio is considering telling big rig drivers to keep on trucking and not to park on city streets. There are already restrictions on parking semi trucks and other oversized vehicles in residential areas, but now a new proposal would tackle overnight parking on non residential streets. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us that could also open up another issue. Usually this area right here is completely packed. Beckwith Boulevard shoots straight off the I-10 frontage road on the north side. John Wood, who heads up a nearby HOA, has been left frustrated with how many semi-truck drivers use the street to park overnight. Someone usually comes and picks them up or they have Uber come pick them up and they go somewhere else. He says the street isn't made for all these trucks. And with a fire station and middle school nearby, he worries about safety. But it's not illegal to park there. He says Manny Pelias' council office has helped with a workaround by getting nearby businesses to agree to overnight parking restrictions. It's a piecemeal process because each individual business has to be able to give up the parking in front of their own business just to get rid of the 18 wheelers. Now prompted by Councilman Pelias, the city is considering a 2 to 6 a.m. ban on parking oversized vehicles on non-residential streets. So no more piecemeal. There are multiple uh, businesses um, that offer parking for truckers right here. So there are options for them, but the street shouldn't be one of them. But one of those businesses says it's not quite so easy. It would be devastating. Beatrice why Foster would, says uh, parking at yards like her family's costs 100 to 200 bucks a month. But their yard has a wait list over 50 trucks long. And she says others are filled up too. There just isn't enough truck yards to park all of the trucks in the city of San Antonio, much less the ones that are hauling uh, across the nation. Just over two miles away from the yard is a street that Foster says is known as Trucker's Row, sitting behind a Home Depot. But if it becomes illegal to park here, she wonders, where will these drivers go? If they don't assist truck drivers in finding a legal parking lot, then they're going to continue to have the problem and make make the statewide problem even much more difficult for them to for them to solve. The idea is set to go to the full city council, but it's not yet clear when. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. We do want to point out that the owner of that truck yard featured in this story is related to a KSAT producer. Check out weather right now. Live cam outside, 97 degrees. We're commenting at 5 o'clock. Hard to even find a cloud out there. But 
it's not triple digits at this time. So yeah. we got that going for us. And always optimistic, Myra. <laughs> she <Not>. is. <laughs> we were 98 for the high temperature today, so two degrees shy of triple digits. Actually, 100 is the record. And typically, this time of year, you have to hit 100 to get into that record-breaking territory. The average high, though, down to 89 degrees. It, we're not going to be anywhere near that anytime soon. We did make it to 100. Uvalde, Carrizo Springs, 102, Catula. Del Rio topped out at 103. The rest of us well into the 90s. And as we go through the evening hours, temperatures just gradually falling off. We'll be down into the 80s by 10 o'clock, 84 degrees, midnight, 81. I'll be back to give you an update on our rain chances and what day may show more potential in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. We've got some breaking traffic news I want to bring you right now. This is 410 at Evers. It's the eastbound lanes that you see are very backed up there on the uh, lower level, not on the access ramp that you see above. We are told there's a car fire up ahead along 410. It looks because we don't see any smoke like that car fire is out, but it's going to take a while for them to get actually the wreckage out of the way. Again, this camera is at 410 and Evers. We are looking eastbound. You can see a big backup because of that car fire just down the road. Happening this Friday, KSAT Community partnering with the San Antonio Food Bank to help fight hunger during Hunger Action Month. On Friday, we'll be hosting a town hall starting at 2.30 so you can learn how to give back. We'll be live streaming the town hall on your website. You can also find more information about Hunger Action Month on KSAT.com. And then on Saturday, it is our annual Head for the Cure 5K to raise money for brain cancer research. This event is in honor of our late news director, Jim Boyle, who passed away 10 years ago. If you'd like to register, go to Head for the Cure slash San Antonio. You can use the code KSAT for $5 off the registration fee. The 5K starts this Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. It's a program aimed at allowing some criminal defendants in Bear County the chance to clean their criminal records. It's called pretrial diversion. But a months long examination by KSAT investigates found many people approved by prosecutors to enter that program continue to commit crimes, including violent offenses. A former Bear County prosecutor talked about the challenges that PTD pretrial diversion poses. These people don't have much of a criminal history to judge by, and the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. In just a few minutes, KSAT sits down with District Attorney Joe Gonzalez to talk about why he's actually expanded the pre-trial diversion program while he's been in office. Still to come here at 6 o'clock, millions of bats take flight right in our own backyard. We'll take you to the Bracken Cave Preserve to get a look at that unique bat NATO next. A communication problem. That's what one Bear County judge blames for the strained relationship between San Antonio police and the district attorney's office. Why he says the bail system is not the issue. That's tonight on the Night Beat at 10. Did you know that one of the largest populations of mammals in the world right here in our backyard? This is pretty cool. The Bracken Cave Preserve north of San Antonio is home to an estimated 20 million Mexican free tailed bats that are vital to our ecosystem. RJ Marquez and photojournalist Gavin Nesbitt take us inside the cave and what's known as that bat NATO. One by one, they emerge at sunset on a mission. They're coming out for dinner, so they're going to come out and forage all night long. They'll be flying at least 60 miles away. The Mexican free-tailed bats have become a sight to see, a phenomenon unique to our area. The bats are coming out at the bottom of an 80-foot deep sinkhole, so spiraling out in a counterclockwise vortex we call it a bat NATO. They create the bat NATO to get thousands of colonies out of the cave. When they drop off the ceiling, the vortex, the spiraling vortex that you see, allows those gr smaller groups to get together. We're in the middle of the bat NATO right now. As you can see, there are millions of Mexican free-tailed bats flying behind me, emerging out of this cave right now. We're told that they're gonna forage 150 tons of bugs and insects, basically their food, just tonight. Most of those bugs are gonna be agricultural pests, so they're real important to our local farmers for all the agricultural pests that they eat. While the Mexican free tails are the main tenants during the summer, they aren't the only bat species in our area. 
Biologist Jeremiah McKinney is conducting an acoustic survey at Natural Bridge Caverns to identify how many species call San Antonio home. We've documented with the software indicating possibly 16 species at the ranch, which is a very wide array of species. Many of these species are tree bats, and in the past 15 years, these experts say that urbanization and the drought are their biggest threats. You're obviously losing diversity because they're having to search far and wide to get to water. We have um, 32 different species of bats that call Texas home. When we're losing the, the, that green space, we're losing that habitat for those bats. Farmland is where these free tails are headed tonight. The wind's guiding them as far away as Pleasanton before they return. He can't be being here because we you can hear the bats, you can smell the bats, and you can see the bats. This emergence that we're seeing right now is going to last for at least three and a half hours. Reporting from Bracken Bat Cave, RJ Marcus, KSAT 12 News. All right. Quite, quite literally the Bat Cave. I've been out there before for yeah. that, the mm -hmm. whole thing. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thank you. Thankfully, that area is preserved, so, you know, the people that are in charge of it have it under control because it really is something to witness. And you heard him say you can smell it. Uh, was that your experience? Yeah, I second that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard that from RJ, too. Not always a yeah. pleasant smell, but you Guano. can smell the bats. Exactly. What now? Guano. Yeah. What was that? <laughs> Guano. Guano. <in> <laughs> kind of what they leave behind. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll move on from that. But yeah. also the the whole ecosystem out there, like the snakes that perch up trying to, you know, snag a bat periodically, the predator Oof. birds that swoop in to yep. grab their dinner. Yeah, it's a whole e part of the whole ecosystem. It's interesting. Okay, weather headlines here. Unseasonably warm, subtle changes though, Sunday into Monday, and that gives us a shot at some rain. Don't get too excited yet, but at least there's potential and one day starting to show a little more promise. That is Monday. Now we're going to be dry more of the same all the way through the weekend. It's late Sunday when we could see a few showers pop up and then on Monday a weak frontal boundary stalls near our area. Exactly where it is is uncertain, but it does at least give us that potential and the acronym here that possibly higher that little side note, the asterisk with this graphic. So we had 30% now for Monday, but there's the chance and of course hope that we could raise it. I don't do wish casting though. Not going to wish cast it. Got to have the evidence there. So check back in for the updates. All right, here's the satellite radar. Big picture of what's going on with our overall weather pattern. Upper level high centered over northern Mexico. It's close enough to be the primary influence in our weather right now. That's why we're sunny, high and dry, temperatures above average. Average, by the way, 89, and we're well into the 90s. And the active weather's all off to the north of us. It's being deflected around this upper level high, which remains in control for several more days, but it does start to slide westward Sunday into Monday. No coincidence, that's when we have a shot at rain, is when that high is suppressed back farther south, down to the south and west, and opens the door for an upper disturbance or that weak boundary at the surface to move in. Overall rainfall potential though, when you look at the big picture, it's especially up and down the midsection of the country and across the northern tier of the US. I do think parts of Texas will get some rain in the days ahead. Just for us, I don't think the odds are as good as some locations off to the north. We can't even make a cloud out there right now. 97 degrees, a dew point is 63. It feels like it's a few degrees warmer than the air temperature. Lubbock at 92, Abilene 99, 98 in Junction, Dallas 93. Most of the state in the 90s, we have a few exceptions, a few triple digits here and there. Del Rio, for example, Castroville and Pleasanton, both at 100, even Converse 98. And Stinson Airport on the south side right now at 98 degrees. Dew points are at the lowest point they're going to get all day. This is that typical pattern. Very humid at night and in the morning. Dew points drop off, drier air mixes down in the afternoon. However, if you're going to be outside later on to tonight, get ready to feel that humidity. Dew points in the 70s here along the Gulf Coast and that sea breeze is kicking in that wind from the southeast. You notice that gusty wind at night, 9, 10, 11 o'clock. Well, that boosts our humidity. So gusty wind this evening and our dew points climb back up into the 70s as a result. Tomorrow we start the day at 76 degrees. We're 90 degrees at noon, 98 for the high temperature. Typical southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Basically more of the same 
as we go through the day tomorrow and then we just repeat it the next few days. 100 in Catula and Carrizo Springs, Del Rio up to 102. Most of us in the upper 90s, but it'll be a close call for many locations. I mean, it's not that we're not accustomed to triple digits after what we went through this summer. Looking ahead, the, I do want to point out the fall equinox is on Saturday morning a little before 2 a.m. Otherwise, we have that little temperature drop Monday, Tuesday with those rain chances. A look back at our summer and how many record highs were broken. I just looked it all up. I'll have that at 645. Oof. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Adam. Oof, oof is right. Oof. Yeah. All right. It may be hard to believe two games where they dominated into the season, but the Cowboys aren't even at full strength yet, Larry. No, they're missing starters on both sides of the ball that haven't even played yet during the regular season. One of those guys, safety Donovan Wilson out of Texas A&M, it sounds like he's getting close to his comeback. Plus, in college football, Texas State, they are a huge, and I mean huge, favorite home for their game coming up on Saturday. Coming up. Oh, it's great, man. You know, just being a part of the community, seeing what's going on in the community, meeting, meeting people all the time is great. You know, the Spurs do a great job of getting us involved. So, um, you know, anytime we can get out here and be a part of stuff like this is great. Yeah, Zach Collins loves to give back to the San Antonio community in big board sports. Ahead of his third season with the Spurs, power forward Zach Collins spent some time at the newly renovated Antioch Sports Complex and Community Center last night. This renovation was completed through Spurs Give and Frost Operation Renovation Grant of $100,000. Zach was part of the ribbon cutting ceremony, then he stuck around to help work a volleyball game. During a recent podcast of Richard Jefferson, Collins said the Spurs have held some mini camps and that all the younger players were very involved, which is certainly a good thing to help them get ready for the regular season. Great. When you have such a young team, anytime you can get together, get some reps in together, help them understand the game a little bit more in the NBA, and um, especially with all the new guys coming in, like it, it, it's huge. It's huge. And, and even for the, the older guys on our team, we don't have a lot of older guys, but guys that have been here for a while, it's the more reps you can get in the offseason, it's going to make the season a lot easier. So it, it's been big time. Zach and the Spurs will tip off the preseason Monday, October the 9th at the OKC Thunder. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys have the overall number one ranked defense in the NFL, and they've done it without the services of safety Donovan Wilson, who's been out with a calf issue that he suffered in training camp. But the good news is Wilson was a full participant in practice today as he looks to make his 2023 regular season debut. Last season, he led the boys with 101 total tackles to go along with nine quarterback hits, five sacks, two forced fumbles, and a pick. Coach McCarthy was asked, what does he miss from not having Donovan on the field? Well, Don, Don was an impact player. I mean, you know, he, he, you know, his teammates feed off of his play style. Um, you know, he's a big part of our standard of, of, of how we play on defense. Um, so it'll be great to get him back out there. And you know, end of the week, we'll see exactly where we are. But it'll be, I mean, you feel, you feel Don when he's on the field. Now, if coach is talking that way, it certainly sounds like Wilson could play Sunday, 3:25 p.m. at the Arizona Cardinals in Dallas is favored by 12. In college football, the Texas State Bobcats are 2-1 and one after beating Jackson State 77-34 on Saturday. The Bobcats' 77 points are its most scored since it registered a program record 78 versus Meridian College in 1920. Now the Bobcats are favored by 17 points to beat Nevada Saturday night. I'm, I mean, you know, if you ask the guys on the team, they probably don't even know that. Um, you know, I think they do a really good job. Uh, their head coach does a really good job. Uh, he's going to have those guys prepared. They're going to play extremely hard. You know, they'll be ready. Um, you know, they played really well this past week. And um, so those guys will be, you know, probably have some confidence to them and, and um, that type of deal. So. Two and one Texas State will host 0 and three Nevada Saturday night at six at Bobcat Stadium. Boy, they're favored by that much over Nevada. Yeah, 17. Wow, man. New era. And Sam Marcus. That's right. What do they say? Eat him up. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I've heard that around the newsroom. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Larry. Case that investigates is coming up next.